The diamondback terrapin is North America's only truly estuarine species of turtle. It's the one species that occurs and spends its entire life in estuarine environments. The turtle is evolutionarily derived from aquatic freshwater turtles, not sea turtles. And so it exists in these brackish water habitats, living in salt marshes, seagrass beds, tidal creeks, and reproducing in the adjacent upland environments. My name is Randy Chambers. I'm the director of the Keck Environmental Field Lab, uh, located at William & Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Terrapins live all the way extending from the North Shore of uh, Cape Cod in Massachusetts, down along the Atlantic seaboard, around Florida, along the Gulf Coast, all the way to Texas. So the species has a very broad distribution, but individually populations of turtles are very localized and, and tend to stay in a, in a rather small area. A typical turtle uh, will live decades, uh, sometimes 30 or 40 years. My name is Megan Thomas, and I'm a wildlife biologist with the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. This is a really, really unique turtle species because they're actually the only estuarine specialist in North America. And if you're not familiar with estuaries, these are these transitional habitats between the marine or ocean environments and our inland freshwater habitats. So the salinity or the salt levels in these waters fluctuate from being almost completely fresh to almost completely salty. And, and that's where terrapins make their lives and, and really spend most of the, their time. They eat almost exclusively snails, periwinkle snails, and herbivorous crabs. So they're actually really, really important to maintaining the overall ecosystem in these habitats because without terrapins in place, those prey items have the potential to just completely overgraze the, the salt marsh cord grass in, in these habitats. So terrapins are a really, really important predator to, to keep those populations in check. Another thing that's really cool about terrapins is that um, they're a species that exhibits female biased sexual size dimensions Morphism. So basically that means that the female terrapins are much larger than the males. The, the terrapin that I've got in my hand here, this is an adult male. So you can get a feel for the size that a male would be, whereas um, a female is going to be close to twice this size. And they're also just an absolutely beautiful species. No two terrapins look completely the same. There's so much variability. I mean, they're absolutely incredible. They're a species that has a very, very long uh, history <laughs> with Virginia. Um, the word terrapin actually comes from the Algonquin word to rope, which roughly stands for uh, like good tasting turtle. Uh, so they were a really, really common food source of Native Americans. And then when English settlers arrived, uh, they really did not share uh, the Native Americans taste for terrapins. But then right around the like mid 1800s, uh, something kind of shifted and uh, terrapins actually became really, really widely harvested uh, for use in a dish called turtle soup. They were harvesting terrapins and, and shipping them, you know, in mass, mass numbers, hundreds, if not thousands, to these locations where they were just in such high demand. Um, so that amount of, of harvesting, that really uh, was pretty detrimental to the populations. Uh, you went from being able to really, really easily collect hundreds of, of terrapins in a single day to, in some cases, uh, like wiping them out entirely at, at a local level. Um, the big shift for terrapins was actually a surprise savior of, of prohibition. Once prohibition came in to play, nobody could access sherry or alcohol anymore. And that was actually a really, really necessary ingredient for terrapin soup or turtle soup, because as much as people um, loved the dish, it was, it was actually, my understanding is it didn't taste that good. And the alcohol was a very, very important ingredient to help cut down on the, um, the funkiness of, of the turtle in the soup. So once, uh, once nobody could legally secure sherry anymore, um, the dish sort of went out of fashion and it gave terrapins a chance to, to start to rebound a little bit. Today, some of the big things that they deal with are things like road mortality, 
habitat loss, you know, loss of, of natural shorelines, as well as a bycatch related mortality from crabbing. A turtle that crawls up on land and crawls across a road may get hit by traffic. And so that is a major threat to adult turtles is the loss of females that are emerging from the water to nest and getting hit on the road. But by far the larger loss of adult turtles is their drowning in commercial crab traps that are set in the blue crab fishery. The diamondback terrapin habitat overlaps significantly with the blue crab fishery. So any place where crabs are being fished, then this poses a potential problem for the diamondback terrapin that is occurring in those exact same habitats. These traps have been used since the 1940s uh, in the commercial crabbing fishery and uh, they have funnels on each side of the trap and there are four funnels for each side of a trap that has that is in size two feet by two feet by two feet it's essentially a net cube or a um, wire mesh cube uh, in which funnels are recessed and the crabs are able to access the bait that is set in the traps by going into these funnels the funnels are sort of a one-way design so that things that get in can't get out so both crabs and turtles that get into traps are unable to get out of the traps. And because the pots are submerged underwater for 24 hours at a time while they're being fished for crabs, any turtles that get caught in there eventually will drown. And so this becomes a significant source of mortality for diamondback terrapins when they get captured as bycatch in commercial crab pots. So with millions of traps set each day, and even just a small number of uh, turtles that get caught in these traps and drown in the traps, you can imagine that overall, there, it ends up being a large number of turtles throughout the course of any year that are lost to crabbing. A lot of research has been completed over the last 40 years to try to identify ways to reduce the total number of turtles that are lost in these commercial style crab traps. And the best way to do this is by finding a way to decrease the entry of the turtles in the traps, but my maintaining the entry of crabs into the trap. The design of these uh, bycatch reduction devices typically has been to narrow the opening of the funnels of the traps. And so these bycatch reduction devices or BRDs are different shapes, but in essence, Crabs tend to have a low vertical profile and are able to slip in through the bycatch reduction devices. But uh, turtles have a much higher profile, domed shaped shell, and as a consequence, have a little bit more trouble getting through. And so if you are able to impede the entry into a trap by just decreasing the overall height of the funnel, that's a way to reduce the overall bycatch of diamondback terrapins. So research into the effectiveness of bycatch reduction devices uh, has shown this remarkable decrease in the turtle bycatch. But unfortunately, the uh, efforts to demonstrate no effect on crab catch has not been as solid. Some studies have shown that there is an actual increase in crab catch in pots fitted with bycatch reduction devices. But a, a greater number of studies have shown a slight decrease in crab catch. And as a consequence, crabbers are hesitant to utilize a bycatch reduction device on commercial or recreational pots. I'm Kirk Havens. I'm the director for the Center for Coastal Resources Management here at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. We've been doing a lot of work over the last decade or more on the issue of lost and abandoned crab pots, uh, generally also known as derelict crab pots. But they're generally just lost or abandoned either by um, storms moving them around uh, or they can get their buoys caught by recreational boat traffic or, or even commercial boat traffic. And once they lose their buoys, then it's not really possible for the commercial fishers to, to recover them. And so that makes them become lost. They continue to stay on the bottom and continue to capture and kill things over time. So it becomes a really, a really big problem as these accumulate in the Chesapeake Bay. During the active fishing season, there is anywhere from a, f a couple to few hundred thousand pots that are in the bay at any one time during the season. And so with that, there's always a percentage of 
of pots that are lost. Over the years, there have been funding that would actually hire commercial fishers to go out and remove these lost or abandoned pots. And we've done that over uh, probably about six years or so where we've hired them uh, to go out and, and remove them. And they're very, very good at that. The commercial fishers and crabbers know where these traps are and they uh, are very good at recovering them. And so we've had a program that would look at this uh, over time, uh, over the years, but it's sporadic. And so because anywhere from 10 to 20% of these traps are lost or pots are lost annually, you know, they can be continue to capture and kill lots of animals. And so it's important to be able to figure out a way once to either to remove them periodically or have mechanisms that, that allow things to escape from them over time, or in the case of terrapin, to prevent them from even entering the pot in the first place. One of the things that the public can actually do regarding lost pots is if they're doing their own type of uh, uh, crabbing off their piers or putting out their own pots, they can actually put in what we call BRDs or bycatch reduction devices or escape mechanisms, something that allows these terrapin to either not get in pots or to be able to get out of, out of pots once they're in them. Another area where uh, just the average citizen can help is if they do deploy crab pots off of their piers or shoreline, is that they need to check them regularly. You can't just leave them out there for multiple days because ultimately, Terrapin can get in those and uh, and they'll drown. So in Virginia, diamondback terrapins are a tier two species of greatest conservation need. Uh, that basically means that they are uh, desperately in need of some type of conservation or management action or their populations are um, going to continue declining and, and possibly even go extinct in the near future. I'm Robert Isdell. I am a research scientist at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. We're working with the Department of Wildlife Resources to help inform some community science work. They're looking to have community scientists go out and survey for diamondback terrapins, and we've been helping to uh, kind of guide them on, on places where we know diamondback terrapins likely are, uh, places where we're not sure if they are, and really use the work that we've done to help, help sort through a, a priority ranking. So we've been studying the distribution of diamondback terrapins around the Chesapeake Bay. We went out and did a, a lot of surveys, looking to see where they were, where they weren't. And what we found was that uh, terrapin are, are primarily located in places with a reasonable amount of marsh. So it doesn't have to be a gigantic marsh, um, but they're probably not gonna be in places with lots of very narrow, um, very narrow fringing marsh. We also found a lot of things that negatively impact diamondback terrapin. So we found um, the amount of agriculture within an area, the amount of shoreline armoring and uh, the number of active crab pots all had serious negative impacts and they really could work together too. We're places where you had lots of all of them um, put together could really decrease the chances that diamondback terrapins could successfully uh, be in those areas and so with that information we could then take that kind of map it back out over across the uh, across the bay and really get a, a good sense of where diamondback terrapins are likely to be um, around Virginia. The use of bycatch reduction devices, or BRDs, in pots is probably most appropriate where um, terrapin habitat is. And so we, we have a good idea of where the hotspots of <clears throat> terrapins are. And so it wouldn't be something that would necessarily be required um, baywide. Uh, but, in er but particularly in areas where we know terrapin are, this could be a really effective mechanism to avoid uh, the terrapins drowning in these in these pots. And so we do have an idea where those are. We would consider those terrapin hotspots. And if you're going to be crabbing rec recreationally or commercially in those areas, then having some type of bycatch reduction device would be very helpful in reducing terrapin mortality. Obviously, we want to try to get people to utilize bycatch reduction devices, uh, but it's been a difficult thing. I, I think a, a lot of uh, commercial and recreational users just aren't aware of the extent of the problem for diamondback terrapins. They are not familiar with terrapin as a turtle species and uh, have not been educated on the overall uh, impacts of crabbing on turtle populations. So one of the things that we're trying to do is, is come up with ways to uh, provide greater awareness of the turtle and the plight of diamondback terrapins 
in the crab fishery. And I think the more opportunities and the more times that there are that people report seeing terrapins, then I think the overall education of the community will increase. And it's not until we get to that level before I think there will be a general push more broadly, not just amongst people who are crabbing, but more amongst conservationists, uh, environmentalists, uh, and the general community that will say, this is something that we need to do.